Thanks, guys. Morning. Oh, boy. Okay. Thanks, Margita. All those wonderful memories, literally. Oh, my goodness. Our last service of June, wow. Summer has hit, as we can all feel. And we've been complaining long enough, so we're happy. It's wonderful, terrific. A couple of reminders in our bulletin. Please take a moment and read through everything. But mark on your calendars our 90th anniversary celebration. It's really going to be a nice chance to get together with hopefully friends that maybe are away and can come back or haven't been with us for a while and can come and uh, renew friendships. So that'll be coming up and you'll be getting a lot more of that information as uh, the summer and September hits. Our rummage sale, you never know what treasures you're going to find. There's always some goodies in there. Please uh, mark that on your calendar too. It's July 20th. And uh, I know that they're working very hard to get things ready for that as well. And our new to you shop, which is downstairs, Lori is still looking for some volunteers. If you're able to help her out, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, the anniversary, back to the 90th anniversary, if you're interested in helping in the planning, please give the church office a call. If they don't answer, just leave the message. They'll get back to you, okay? So thank you again. Thank you for reading the uh, other minutes that are in here. And let us now prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to make one brief announcement. At the end of service, I'll be beginning a month of vacation. <gasps> By extension, I imagine that's a vacation for you too, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> Certainly for Pat. <laughs> uh, just to let you know that Reverend Kathy Collins Barker, She's the minister at Glenwood United Church in the uh, South End. She'll be filling in for me for any pastoral care emergencies. Um, she provided two telephone numbers to me. So look for those in the bulletin next week. It's not in this week's bulletin, but it will be in the bulletin next week. And if you do have any emergencies, I encourage you just to simply call the front office if you don't have a bulletin handy, and Irma can give you the numbers as well if you have an emergency to talk to Kathy about. Okay, and I'll be back, uh, I think it's August 5th. August 5th, so that's five Sundays from now. Okay? I'm back the 11th, Margita just told me. <laughs> she keeps me on track. <laughs> so the 11th. <laughs> so don't get in too much trouble while I'm gone, I pray. But if you do get into some, remember, as I always say, that keeps me employed, and I thank you for it. Job security, that's it. Well, as you know, every Sunday we begin our service with a call to worship. A call to encounter the God who loves us and searches for us. And most Sundays we all come. We come and we make ourselves intentionally present to the God who is forever with us. But now and again we need to check what motivates us to come in the first place. If we come, we ought to come not because it's a duty, 
but because it's a delight. We ought to come not because a minister called us, but because God called us. We ought to come not to display to the world our finest clothes, but to witness to the world our faith in God. We ought to come not to show off to others our goodness, but to search together for God's righteousness. We ought to come not to be complimented on our proficiency, but to hear the word speak to our deficiencies. Okay. We ought to come not to listen while others are condemned, but to hear how we have sinned. We ought to come not to take away whatever God will give us, but to go away fitted for service. And so I bid you come. Come and encounter the God who searches for us. And to begin, let's first relax. Make yourselves comfortable. And breathe in. God's presence. Breathe it in. Let us pray. Gracious one, we enter into your holy presence giving thanks and praising you. We come seeking transformation and renewal. Without you, we are not whole. We lack completeness. Touch us in this time of worship, O God, that we may become your new creation, rooted in Christ and open to your spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 391 in Voices United. We'll sing the first verse of God Reveal Your Presence. 391. time for Christianity 101. Remember we did this a, uh, a little while back? It's a time that uh, we can learn more about what we do in church and why we do it. Okay? Bear with me. What we do on Sunday morning is, of course, worship. We might also say that we follow a worship liturgy. The word liturgy is a composite of two Greek words meaning the work of the people. That's what liturgy means, the work of the people. Here at Riverside, though, we've become accustomed to use that phrase more to represent the work we do at the church in general, all the activities we're involved with. More than this, we're now accustomed to use that phrase to represent the the various announcements we make on a Sunday morning prior to the service, the work of the people. However, the work of the people is actually the complete worship service. Worship is our work together. That's what worship is. And it's something that the Reformation gave back to us as Protestants. 
It allowed us as people to worship in our own language and to give voice to our own prayers and our own songs. Worship is our work as the people of God together, listening and responding to what God has to say to us. Worship. Now, just a few words about two very important elements of the worship service. The preludes and the postludes. The preludes and the postludes, in my view, are really the bookends of the service, right? They open and close the worship service. Ultimately, I'm, I think Margita would agree with me, the purpose of the prelude is to enter into the holy space by quieting ourselves and preparing for worship. Now, we can enter this holy space in a number of ways, either through prayer, through music, even through meditation on what we think God is saying to us. Here at Riverside, it has become qu uh, quickly apparent to me that music is the preferred way to enter the holy space, which is why Margita plays prior to every service. However, as we know, the time tends not to be very quiet, right? Rather, we can hear boisterous conversation taking place during the prelude. Still, the prelude is meant to provide a time and a context during which God speaks to us and we respond to God. The prelude. Now, I sometimes think that this back and forth between we and God actually takes place in the form of we speaking together. See if you agree with me on this. In other words, it takes place in the form of God residing within me, having a conversation with the God residing in you. And the same thing between your neighbors and with your friends. I call it holy conversation. Because God is somehow mysteriously involved in that conversation. Does that make sense? And I think that all takes place when we're speaking with our neighbors. Now, in worship, including during the prelude, this is important. Music is never presented as a performance for the congregation, but rather as an offering of praise, of thanksgiving, of penitence, even petition to God. While worshipers are often caught up in the beauty of the music or in the, the lyrics of the song, its purpose is not to bring attention to the musicians or to the singers. but rather to point to the creator who makes all things beautiful and enables us to be creative as well. It's for this reason that for the most part, we do not clap. We do not clap after any playing or singing of music in a worship service. Not because we don't appreciate it, because for certain we do but because we believe that it is God herself who is the ultimate audience of our worship. So now you know why you have that inclination to clap and you look around and many people aren't. And that's the reason behind it. The finishing bookend to our service is the postlude. The postlude is meant to capture the grandeur of God's majesty and of the day's worship. 
That's what the Pope flute is meant to do. Increasingly, many congregations remain seated during the postlude as a fitting time of reflection at the conclusion of worship. And out of courtesy, of course, to the organist or, and the other musicians. So there you have it. Prelude and postlude in Christianity 101. I hope you understand a little bit more about why we do these things in the church. And when I return from my vacation, I hope to continue on with a few more tidbits to make everyone at ease during the worship service and have a better understanding of why we do the things we do. Now, listen. As Gail Stoneman and Margita Lang worship God using their wonderful gifts of music, and I dare say, you're going to find it extremely difficult not to clap at the end. Now invite the youngest members of our congregation to come forward, spend a few minutes with me at the front. Joey, how are you? Come on up. Hi, kids. <coughs> I won't get too close. I have a bad cold. Oh. Cough, cough, cough. So you having a good week so far? 
Yeah? You like in summertime? School's over, right? Hey? It is over? I got that right, didn't I? Yeah. It ended last Friday? Thursday? Wow. So have you got great plans for the summer? Yeah? Are you going anywhere? Out where? Grand Bend. Oh, wow. African Safari? The fake one? What, they have plastic animals? What is it? They're real? Oh, right. It's not in Africa. Gotcha. Gotcha. What about you, Johnny? What do you got planned? Keep an eye on your brother for sure, right? Eh? <laughs> hey? Well, you know what? I'm going to be working on my backyard again. The never-ending patio that can't finish being built. I've been working on it. As a matter of fact, I was working on it all last week in that heat. Oh, and Susan wouldn't let me in, come in for supper until I did some work. She can be nasty sometimes. Susan? That one over there. The one with the stripes, like the, uh, like, yeah, like the zebra. No, they got something going up there. You see, they're all, there's about three or four of them with stripes. They're starting a herd. <laughs> oh, I'm digging a hole real deep now. Just taking those brownie points and throwing them right out the window. So, when I was working last week, I got so thirsty, though, Susan would bring me out bottles of water. Just kept bringing them out, bringing them out, and I'd be drinking them. I was so thirsty. Oh, have you guys ever been that thirsty? Like, have you ever, during the summertime, during the heat wave, where you were so thirsty? Tell me about it. Like, what were you doing that made you so, so thirsty? Your tongues were hanging out. Your face was red. What was it? What were you doing? And it tastes really good, eh? And you drank gallons of that, I bet. Eh? Just, hey. So you guys have been real thirsty before. Are you thirsty now, by chance? Just talking about it, I bet you, is making you thirsty. You're not thirsty, Johnny. What about if I was to offer you a wonderful glass of cold, cold water? You'd say no. You'd say no. You wouldn't want one. Who would want one, though? <laughs> well, let me give you a little bit here. You sure, Johnny? Okay. Okay. Natalie, you going to have some? Oh, <gasps> yes. Because Natalie's going to be working you guys so hard downstairs today, you better take a cup. Oh, yes, my friends. So have a good drink of that. See if that quenches your thirst. Do you know that Jesus once said that if you welcome someone with a cup of water, it's like welcoming him. So if somebody's thirsty and they're really desperate for a cup of water and you provide it, it's like you're giving it to Jesus. And it's not just a cup of water. He was using that as an example, right? It's like if you care for someone who really needs your help and you offer that help, you offer that care, it's just like you were offering that help or that care to Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Hey? So any time you have an opportunity to help somebody, to take care of someone, remember that you're doing that in Jesus' name. Right? Now, I know you weren't thirsty, Johnny, but I want you to do something for me. I want each of you kids, so we got three, to take a glass of nice cold water to someone in the congregation and just say to them, I'll trade glasses with you. Because you're finished with that, right? Because <laughs> now I'm putting you to work. So you go to the, someone, pick somebody in the congregation, maybe somebody you don't even know. 
and say, I'm bringing you this water because I care for you. Okay, let me see you do it. Pick somebody. Look for somebody with their tongue hanging out. <laughs> Lori Grevin over there, I can see hers. <laughs> oh. Would you like to take another one to someone else? I got lots. Why not? Why not? Oh, that one gets an ice cube. <laughs> hey, wasn't that nice? Did, did it give you joy to do that? It's nice to help people. Look, they're thirsty. They need some living water. Hey? <sighs> no, no, don't throw it. <laughs> oh, that was fun, eh? So remember that. Whenever you help someone, you're helping in Jesus' name because you're Christians and you believe in that, right? Do you want to say our prayer before we go out to Sunday school? Who's going to lead? Okay, let's go. God be in my eyes and in my... God be in my... And in my... Listen. God be in my, and in my, God be in my, and in my, and we all say together, Amen. Have fun, guys. You want to finish your water, don't you? Sorry. You may remember the old Aesop's fable of a dog with a bone in his mouth. Have you heard this one? He was going somewhere either to chew it or to bury it. We don't know. But in the process, he walked across a creek on a log. Right? And as he walked, he looked down into the water. There he saw another dog with a bone in his mouth. Hmm? Why should I settle for one bone when there's another one close at hand? He pondered. Why settle for one meal when I could have two? He asked. Not realizing that the other dog was a reflection of himself, he opened his mouth to grasp the other bone. Dropping his own bone, of course, in the process. And losing both. Right? Getting and grasping for something often means losing, doesn't it? Giving without any expectation of something in return usually leads to gratitude. And often that gratitude leads to even further generosity. Something to keep in mind, isn't it? Our offering will now be received, and as it is being collected, we'll sing hymn number 586. We shall go out with hope of resurrection. <laughs>
Let us pray. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, we bring our gifts to you, O God. Help us to give with them a ready mind, a willing spirit, and a joyful heart. Amen. Please be seated.
as we consider the stars and let our minds wander off into the galaxies, we come to feel so small and insignificant that anything we do, say, or think seems completely useless. But if we consider our souls and let our minds wander into the endless galaxies of our interior lives, we become so tall and significant that everything we say or do or think appears of great importance. We have to keep looking both ways to remain humble and confident, humorous and serious, playful and responsible. Yes, the human person is very small and very tall, both significant and unimportant. And it is the tension between the two that keeps us spiritually awake. And so keeping that tension within our spirits, let us now open our hearts to God in silent prayer and confession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know these two things. Number one, you matter. And number two, God loves you. It doesn't get better than that. I now invite Joyce to come forward. She's going to read to us a well-known passage written by the Apostle Paul. From 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the first 13 verses. This passage was written long ago by the Apostle Paul and it's still read today at many weddings. It describes the most important ingredient in a life of Christian dis discipleship. So from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient 
Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a woman, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Thanks be to God for his word to us. And now I'd like to read to you a short passage from the book of Matthew, from the 10th chapter. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes God's messenger, because he is God's messenger, will share in his reward. And whoever welcomes a good man because he is good will share in his reward. You can be sure that whoever gives even a drink of cold water to one of the least of these my followers, because he is my follower, will certainly receive a reward. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me, Jesus says. Whoever welcomes God's messenger will share in his reward. The words spoken here by Jesus tie back into what he said earlier in the chapter, or rather what he did earlier in the chapter, when he dispatched the disciples to their mission, essentially unpacked, unpacked. No full suitcase, no three pairs of sandals, two cloaks, half a dozen tunics, a hairbrush, and money for the hotel. To the contrary, Jesus forces his disciples to rely on the kindness of strangers. The strangers they would encounter along their way. If their message is worth hearing, Jesus thinks, and if the disciples present that message in a loving way, then people will take them in. It's a theme that culminates at the end of the chapter with the now famous image of someone handing a cup of cool water to a disciple. In some ways, the whole thing is surprising. We tend to think that receiving the gospel is purely a spiritual matter. If someone, quote-unquote, comes to Jesus so to speak, because of the preaching of an evangelist, we expect the result of this conversion to be new patterns of thought, a new sense, perhaps, of morality, and a new inward devotion to God. 
And indeed, those traits ought to be visible. I'm not saying otherwise. But we rarely think that the first result of someone's new life in Christ ought to be to invite the stranger over to supper. But perhaps part of the reason we don't think along those lines is because we tend to separate the message from the messenger in the way that Jesus does not. It's important. For Jesus, the messenger is the message. You follow me? You and I are the gospel message by the way that we act toward others. We're the message. Right? We're the message. Throughout this chapter, if you read it very carefully, there's a close fit between the person who talks about Jesus and Jesus himself. You'll always see this going back and forth. He who welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus says. He doesn't say, if they believe the words you speak, then my spirit will come fill their hearts. He doesn't say anything like that. No. He says that if people find cause enough to love the disciples, to welcome them into their homes by virtue of the way that they act, then Jesus himself will be present in the homes as well. There's a true story I want to tell you about a Protestant church in Northern Ireland. A man was greeted at the door of the church by two women who seemed to invite him into some pleasant conversation. The two women were ushers whose job it was to stand at the door of the church and interview newcomers as they arrived. They quietly asked the man's name and the first names of any other approaching strangers who wished to join in the morning worship. The man, however, soon figured out what was happening. Hearing those names, the ushers would draw conclusions about the cultural and religious identity of each visitor. It's a true story. Those with Protestant names were welcomed warmly and shown to their seats. Those with seemingly Catholic names, the Marias, the Catherines, and the Patricks, were told that they were surely in the wrong church and were sent on their way. It sounds so foreign to us, doesn't it? Here in Canada, we've moved past all that. In our worshiping communities, everyone is welcome, right? Boundary keeping is so contrary to the gospel, we think. But if we're to be honest about the church we know, we would have to confess that though we may define our boundaries differently, we define them nonetheless and far more subtly. We are curious about one's education and profession. We are curious about one's extended family, about who one's aunts and uncles and cousins might be. While none will be turned away, we tell ourselves that we simply have more in common with those who are like us. 
those who think like us and dress like us and talk like us and join clubs like us. Those who want to be like us. Maybe even be us. Not so far, really, from deciding if the visitor's name sounds Protestant or Catholic. When all's said and done, will the very poor man and his wife feel comfortable in our church? Is there a certain sexual orientation or family model that visitors must demonstrate before the doors of our church are flung wide open to them in welcome. The gospel lesson this morning invites us to ask all these questions about the quality of welcome that we offer to one another within the church. Be it Riverside United Church or the church as a whole. That's what the passage is trying to draw out from us. It goes on to suggest that while we may find reward in gathering only with those whose names sound like our names or whose education or bank accounts resemble our own, there's a huge social cost to such exclusive behavior. Jesus addresses the issue in the most personal of terms. He describes the love that families hold for one another, the tenderness and the compassion with which we care for parents and for children. And what Jesus teaches is that we must extend that same model of compassion and tenderness to all whom we meet. And do so in Christ's name. Take that love for family, Jesus says, that love for your closest community, and extend it further and further and further still. Welcome the stranger. Welcome the one whose life you hardly understand. Not to change them. Never. But simply because they too are God's children. And the question becomes, dare we preach that this is good news? It's certainly good news to those who have been previously barred from entering through the church doors, who in the past have been made to feel unwelcome, But the real good news is for those in the past who guarded the door. Jesus insists that although we might pretend otherwise, we are not the gatekeepers of the community of God. We're not. Our work is to welcome, Jesus says. To offer an embrace when an embrace is invited. To offer a cup of cool water on a hot summer day. For whoever welcomes someone, Jesus says, welcomes me. And the one who sent me.
There's a great hymn about that. A great hymn. Number 600. Let's sing three verses of When I Needed a Neighbor. Please be seated. One of the practices of prayer is to listen carefully to God in the midst of silence. We take our worries, our concerns, our hopes, and our dreams into these deep silences, knowing that God is there. Always. In the long silences of today's prayer, listen for and be open to God. Lift up to God everything on your heart and on your mind. And then listen. Make yourself into a tuning fork that resonates with the Spirit's sighs. Let us pray together. It seems quiet, God. In this quiet, our thoughts rush in to fill the space. Be still. And know that I am God. Your words echo in the silence. In this silence we listen within the depths of our hearts. Putting ourselves in your hands that you may speak.
we are overwhelmed by your holy silence, what words might express our desire for healing and for wholeness? What phrases can strengthen our weakness? What passion, what frequency, what length, what immediacy ought properly tune us to your will? We've got nothing except longings, hopes, dreams, worries, fears, joys, loves. We've got them all. No words, though. Just sighs. Sighs too deep for words. Sighs into the silence of your heart. Thank you for searching our hearts, for knowing our minds, for interceding on our behalf, Spirit of God. We gather our words, our sighs, and our silence as we now pray the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Closing hymn of our service, number 642. We'll sing three verses of Be Thou My Vision.
Thanks, everyone, for worshiping with us this morning. A special thanks to Gail and to Margita for that wonderful, wonderful, would you call it a duet? I, hey, for the lack of a better word. We all enjoyed that immensely. Thank you, thank you for everyone who helps to make a worship service possible in this small corner of our world. It means a lot to each and every one of us, and we thank you for it. And now, as you leave this place, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk the road with you. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. time that we turn it upside down because after all it is Canada Day, Canada weekend, right? And what better song to sing than this land is your land. Do we know the words? Oh.